Good morning and thanks for joining us. And uh, hello everyone and welcome back to part two of our three-part learning journey. Today's session is improving application security with an end-to-end -end approach. My name is Sean Kelly and I'm an application security executive here at GitHub and I'll be your host for today's session. I'm dialing in from Boston. Uh, so let us know where you're dialing in from in the chat section. Also joining us today is Kevin Allwell. Kevin is one of our principal solutions engineers here at GitHub, and he'll be walking us through the majority of today's presentation. And also joining us as a special guest, one of our field security architects here, and his name is Andrew Moose McCoy. Say hello, gentlemen. Hello, gentlemen and ladies. Hi, nice like to be here. It. I like it. So for a um, quick recap of last week's session, why are we still shipping applications with security flaws? So we had a ton of audience participation and we're hoping for the same today. And uh, this was just a list of, of content that came up in the chat while we were, uh, while we were presenting last week. And um, yeah, so today, open session, um, please feel free to interject at any point in time with any questions or statements um, that you might have uh, towards today's session. And with that, Kevin, I'm going to turn yes. things over to you. Thank you. All right, great. So we do have some interesting content prepared for you all. So thank you for, for joining us again. Um, like Sean had kind of set the stage, myself and Mr. Moose um, will be driving the session today. But mostly we're looking for you all to provide feedback, provide maybe you know what you'd be interested in talking through throughout this session today. And we obviously have some prepared content. I'll talk about what that's going to look like. But um, yeah, it, you know, what, the insight that we're sharing with you, just so you have an idea of the origin here, is again, an aggregate of the insight we've gathered from having these conversations about enabling DevSecOps in your own organizations, right? So we've gone out, we've had these conversations with many folks um, about integrating tooling, optimizing best practices, you know, partnering with the development teams, enabling those development teams, all that's under the umbrella of DevOps and DevSecOps. And we've kind of packaged some of that here piecemeal um, for you all to consume. But um, I did want to share, and, and we had brought together some of the feedback we saw from, I think, mostly LinkedIn. We had a lot of folks come on uh, into the LinkedIn stream, so that was awesome. Shout out if you're there now. Um, please just, if you want to drop in the comments there, like where you're, you know, where you're from, what you're interested in, and maybe like an interesting fact about you, that'd be really cool, and we can, we can work from there. Uh, but this is some of the feedback and comments, questions we received from our last session. Um, and I thought it might make sense to bring them, some of them back to the surface as we set the context here and start rolling into um, a, you know, how you can implement a DevSecOps practice and scale that practice across your entire organization. And so Moose is gonna be driving um, some content that we're gonna push your way, but let's first discuss some of these things. And so um, maybe what I'll do first uh, is Moose, I'll invite you to comment on the low hanging fruit here, which is, is CodeQL limited only to SaaS? What is included in the context of GitHub Advanced Security in terms of our tooling? I'd love to hear um, from you. Okay, then I'll take the low-hanging fruit. I'll just softball myself. That's even better. Uh, so, okay, so what's, what's included in the context here about GitHub Advanced Security is just a handful of things. And so um, we're talking about an integrated developer experience. And really that's the foundation for all the tooling that we've uh, rolled out across the platform, right? Um, and so when folks generally talk about an effective DevSecOps practice, they're talking about enabling developers with the latest AppSec tooling and um, enabling them with that tooling as early on in the development process as possible. And so I think what you'll find is, and we're going to do some live demos later, I hope to really go a little bit more hands-on than we did in the last session. But I hope that what you'll find is, when you're talking about shifting left, it's going to be difficult to do that any further left than where your developers spend the majority of their time, which is either, uh, you know, in GitHub where they're doing their development, or you know, in some cases, folks uh, argue for doing that scanning, that uh, analysis in the IDE itself. And but um, so in terms of the tooling, the integrated developer experience, we'll showcase that to you all. There's also um, the native SaaS capability that Paul pointed out, which is CodeQL under the hood. Okay, so that is the engine for our SaaS capability. There's also native secret scanning. And we talked about last week, I don't know what the stat was, I think it was like 
of um, exploits happen through leaked credentials. And so I never like to undersell the value of secret scanning. It's super easy to enable. Um, and it's, you know, it delivers value very quickly. And now what we're continuing to do, and hopefully you'll notice this as, you know, as uh, Moose joins us again and starts to talk through some of the content, is that SCA, Software Composition Analysis, something that's available out of the box today. And a lot of folks love it. I saw in your chat last time, a lot of folks were like, hey, if you don't have Dependabot enabled, I think James, uh, James Z last time was talking about enabling Dependabot. I would encourage you to do that, native SCA inside of GitHub. But um, it, within the context of advanced security, we are layering on some additional capabilities to make it a more advanced enterprise offering. But today, generally, we consider it to be supplemental to your existing SEA tools. Okay, and so really those are the four pillars. You have the integrated developer experience, you have code scanning with CodeQL, secret scanning, and um, some aspects of SCA. Uh, Moose, are you back with us? I can, I wrapped up that one, but I can, we can uh, softball another one here from Reza. Okay, no. Uh, okay, so let's talk through one more of these uh, feedback items. And again, please do feel free to share either in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna make sure we're monitoring the, the public chat here. Um, there it is. Hey, I see people joining from India, people joining from LinkedIn, Portugal, that's awesome. Um, some folks from New Jersey. Oh, that's James again. James, thanks for joining again. I don't know how much time you spent on these LinkedIn streams, but we always see you, so that's awesome. Um, yeah, so welcome all. And, uh, and please do share what it is that you're interested to talk through. Again, this is the type of feedback that we're using to power the session. And so last time we got together, uh, just looking on the bottom right here at one of the comments shared by Reza Risby, which I thought was really interesting. Some folks have these centralized teams that roll out tooling across an organization. How can you effectively do that with GitHub Advanced Security? I'm just gonna like bring it up to the highest level because later on we're actually gonna implement some code scanning pipelines with CodeQL. I had thought about doing it with um, Azure DevOps as well, but for some reason my uh, ADO agent keeps hanging. So maybe I won't uh, put myself on the spot. So anyway, um, how can you effectively do that? Well, what might be interesting, you know, what might be interesting since we're talking a little bit more narrowly about tooling here is to consider the, there's a roadmap item. If you go to, um, and Sean, maybe I can poke you for this one. If you can drop in the link to our public roadmap on GitHub, there is a feature that was going to GA in September. It's called reusable workflows. Thanks, Sean. So reusable workflows is something I definitely encourage you to consider enabling. And so basically what that's going to allow you to do is have a centralized team. Imagine you're like, you know, a DevSecOps team or a team that manages the operations, the pipelines for your entire org. And you want to standardize some of those pipelines. Um, reusable workflows will enable you and empower you to do that. So you can define a single workflow for scanning a tech stack. So you have some flavor of code scanning available and consumable across your entire organization. And so the idea then would be to define these code scanning pipelines in a single place at the top level in your organization and then consume them across uh, your repositories inside your org across your various teams. And so um, that doesn't exactly answer like the entirety of that question. You know, it's a big question, but I thought that might be interesting to share that one piece with you, which is how do you reuse, uh, you know, how do you reuse these code scanning pipelines? How do you scale their implementation and rollout? And that's one of the ways you do that. Moose, I'm going to assume you're back with us here. I just talked through two of these. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Sorry, but it worked. I swear we tested this backstage. Yeah, and it no just problem. crashed on me. That's great. Okay. So I'm going to just roll on to the next slide here, um, calling out some of this content. Let's see um, some interesting feedback. And so, Moose, I'll give you an opportunity to talk about John's comment, which is security is everyone's business. If I can just call out first, I see Thomas Sigwalt over here. He says that he's a self taught uh, front end engineer. Security is everyone's problem. Shout out to you, Thomas. That's awesome that you're learning about security uh, as you're learning about development and that you're a student participating in these talks. So thank you for doing that. Thanks for being here. And Mr. Moose, would you be open to talking about John's comment, security is everyone's business? Absolutely. I mean, it's really, I, I love that comment because you can really take it in so many ways. Um, whether you're thinking even, you know, to, let's take it outside IT for a minute. Think about a company that might be running logistics or large security events that like, there's everyone, the concession stand folks, if they see something going wrong, they're gonna say something. And they're they're thinking about security. When you think about logistics and shipping, you know, when someone ships a um, truck from, one, if a retailer ships a truck, they know where that truck is at all times. They know the contents of the truck. So, and um, when something happens to it, they're notified and there's action plans in place. So, so these things are not new. 
However, for IT, it's really become an afterthought or a check the box exercise as a knee jerk reaction to events that happen. And so really that's where we're working. And I love John's comment because it's really, it is everybody's business from whether it's the person working in the cafeteria at, at the business on site when we maybe get back into an office on day and they see someone walking through without a proper badge on all the way to, to a new developer that happens to see you know, bad coding practices or things along those lines. It, it's, if you see something, say something kind of mentality um, and really just starting to have a conversation. And, and that mentality really helps to me, I think in my mind, bring security from being this, this blocker, this big scary topic to have to just being a part of the normal, normal conversation of, of how work gets done. I love that. There's a lot of brilliance in there. Um, one nugget I picked out was just, you know, it seemed like there was a theme of humanity throughout what you're saying, right? Like we're all people, um, both on the security side of the house and on the dev side. And so if you want to just have a conversation about security, um, you know, and, and build that relationship over time, that's going to be the foundation for an effective program. I mean, you, that's right on the head. I mean, we're all human. And it's like in corporate America, there there tends, uh, thinking back to like when I first was doing DevOps years ago, it's like some folks, like you want to help them do better, but they're, they're scared because they don't know what that change is going to be. So really, instead of kind of going in and just telling someone they're going to change something, you go and knock on the door and say, hey, I'm here to help. How can we, how can we help? And going into things in that mentality really, really, brings folks together more so than making the conversation be a conflict from the beginning. That's awesome. Um, and I think last week we had that silly analogy about like, you know, how difficult it is to change our own behavior. If our doctor recommends that we eat like five servings of vegetables a day, you know, how likely are we to do that even though it's the best thing for us? You know, and then try changing someone else's behavior. If you have a teenager, and I see Sean smiling because he has a daughter as well. I mean, she's older, but um, you know, it's incredibly difficult to influence someone else's behavior. And that's really what we're trying to do here: is bring security to the forefront of a conversation and encourage folks to change the way they're working every day. And I see some commentary from Gerald here, Gerald Hirsch. So thanks for that, Gerald. Um, and just some commentary around like security should not be an afterthought. Built, it should be built into your CI/CD from the jump. It's a key element of DevSecOps. I couldn't agree more. And you know, last time we had spoke last week, um, some folks were asking to see that you know a little bit more of the platform itself rather than us kind of pushing some content your way. And so I hope to do a demo later. We'll enable a code scanning pipeline. It doesn't take much time, but it's uh, it's going to be very practical practical for you all. Um, so anything to add here, Moose, from any of these other comments from folks before we roll into a little bit more review? No, I, I think this this really these convert the the topics in conversation really lend well to kind of what I want to talk about. Um, and I think let's I'm going to pick once we get to that piece, we'll pick I'm going to talk a little bit faster so we can get through that because I think uh, we want to get some more demos today. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, so um, I did want to also recap for the folks who weren't here with us last week some of the pillars, if you will, of um, effective DevSecOps programs. And so this is a list of practices and ideas. Um, that we kind of ferreted out from conversations with enterprise customers who are rolling out advanced security in their own organizations. And so feel free if you're building out your own DevSecOps program, or if you've already built out that program, um, to either share feedback, take some of this and, and implement it yourselves and let us know how that goes. I think that's something we would love to understand, right? Like how effective are these practices? How difficult are they to actually implement inside your own orgs? So please do share that feedback. And for the folks who weren't here, or maybe just could use a little bit of a refresher, I'm just gonna talk through these things briefly um, so we're all again on the same page. Um, so one of the things that we see being very effective in a commonality um, when it comes to rolling out AppSec programs across organizations is that the AppSec team who's gonna be responsible for rolling out that program, right? If it's being led by the security side of the house rather than the uh, you know, kind of pure engineering side, is to have this systematic consultation. And so what that means is, and we'll talk about what teams you would consult with, but what that means is, again, you're coming together with those development teams as an AppSec team, and you're trying to help them understand during their planning, you know, during their planning of their next sprint, why it would benefit them to integrate AppSec, how they can go about integrating AppSec, um, you know, any technical hurdles that they might face in that integration. And so this really means that you're you're sitting down with them in a sprint planning cycle, or maybe you actually have a task, a work item that you're going to work with the developer on to integrate to Gerald's point previously into one of their existing pipelines. And so this is very much um, like 
an all-encompassing consultation where you would go in as an uh, AppSec lead and, uh, and sit down with those developers and talk about what it means to integrate security into their own applications. Okay, and so that's one way that we see folks systematically rolling out uh, AppSec across the org. Now, one other thing that's really interesting is the Champions program. And so a, another commonality we see from folks who are kind of a little bit higher, a little bit further along, if you will, uh, on the maturity scale of this of the, of rolling out a program is having some champions across the engineering org. So these champions are the types of people who want to pick up new technology. They're interested in understanding the latest dev practices more than they're, you know, kind of... Uh, hyper-focused, if you will, uh, singularly focused is probably a better way to say it, on just delivering that feature that it is that's up in their sprint cycle. They're also trying to encapsulate um, the best practices. And so these folks can be really impactful, right? If you enable them to understand your organization's position on AppSec, but also to have those consultative conversations with their own teams and the teams around them, then all of a sudden you're not just uh, training yourselves on how to roll out this program, but you're training the trainer. Right, so you are training the person who's gonna then train the end user, the developers, on how to roll out the program. And so a little bit tongue in cheek here, the Venn diagram is an awesome tool which would help you focus your, both the consultative approach and these champion programs in terms of like which teams you might wanna focus on as you begin to roll out your program. Okay, so what teams are you gonna focus on as you be begin to roll out your program? And so there's really three axes here, if you will. So there's um, the supported languages of the tools that you've, you've adopted, right? So CodeQL supports some languages extremely well, JavaScript, Python, Java, you know, just uh, to, to name a few. Um, so you wanna get uh, supported languages if you're using CodeQL or any other SaaS tooling. Um, you also wanna understand um, where that team is on the adoption curve. So are they innovators? Are they early adopters? If yes, and they have a supported language, maybe that's a great place to start, right? But the problem can be that, okay, here's a team that wants to adopt the AppSec tooling. They have a supported repo, but their application is, you know, some kind of ancillary app. Maybe it's like an R&D Skunk Works type project, and it's not high in terms of app criticality. And so for us on the AppSec side, it's going to be difficult for us to justify the cost of that AppSec tooling, right? And the time and energy, et cetera. So the last axis is the app criticality. So, um, you know, what is the business impact of this application? Is this, are all of our transactions running through this app? Is this a customer facing app that's out there that drives a lot of traffic back to the business? If yes, and it's, uh, you know, the team is willing to work with us and it's a supported language, that's a really great place for us to start. And for you, maybe you're in a place where you're like, okay, I just have no idea across my repos in my org, which repos actually matter to the business. And so um, I'd encourage you to maybe measure that first. Okay, so I'm just gonna fly through some of these other ones that are a little bit obvious too, right? Like OKR rewards, we're talking about empowering developers um, and also rewarding them. So if they're you know, taking part in your program, they've proven that they're successful, they have great mean times remediation, some other metrics um, when you're extracting that data and measuring the team's effectiveness, you know, if you can reward them in some small way, it, it really has an impact. So I encourage you to consider doing that. Obviously being data-driven, all your insight from GitHub is going to be exportable via API. We also have a security overview dashboard. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've seen folks implement uh, DevSecOps Dojo. Uh, I think it's called DevOps Dojo, DevSecOps Dojo, the open source project. Feel free to do that as well. <coughs> the last thing, um, gradually maturing your orgs, right? And gradually is kind of like the key word there more than it is looking at DSOM and SAM, which are uh, maturity models for DevSecOps because a lot of folks ask out of the gate, they're like, hey, can we enforce policy so you developers can't merge their code as we roll out this program? And, right, that'll break that relationship. And I know Moose has a lot of opinions about this from his own informed conversation. So I'll you know, give him a chance to talk about that in a minute. But um, gradually up-level your maturity of your DevSecOps program, just get it out there. Um, with a small subset of folks who are happy to work with you and just kind of scale as your reputation gets better and better. Now, the last thing I'll talk about um, just before I hand off to Moose to talk about some new content and then we roll into demos is the integrated DevX, right? I just want all of us to be on the same page about the developer being very much at the center of not just what we deliver on the GitHub side of the house, but also what your program should be, right? This is all about partnering with the developer. As AppSec engineers, we've really moved away from just you know, focusing, at, you know, in a silo on security, you're also an engineer yourself, similar to the way, um, you know, QA engineers in the past were just kind of like clicking through your apps to look for regressions. Now they write automation to do that for them. And so this is very much a similar evolution. 
Um, and, you know, we just want to make sure that there is an integrated developer experience in our program. So that means that the tooling should support, um, you know, happy developers. Happy developers are productive developers. If you've read uh, Dr. Nicole Forsgren's space framework lately on um, how to have a productive engineering org. So that's what I want to share with you. Just a little recap from last week. I probably ran long, but um, I'm going to hand over to Mr. Moose to talk to us about the state of application security and share some unique insight on that front. Awesome. Thanks, Kev. I'm actually just, before I dive in, I do want to acknowledge a few good questions coming in here from the crowd. Um, actually, one to you from Bill Williard here on the, uh, the questions is, how do you create a champion if none of your devs are into security? I have some ideas, but I actually like your um, thoughts on this better, Kevin, if you don't mind. Oh, no. Have I expressed thoughts about this in the past? Now I feel like on the spot. <laughs> yeah. How do, you, how do you find a champion? So, again, I think you want a champion who's going to be in an effective place, right? And so when we talked before about like what an effective place for them to be, maybe again, whipping out that Venn diagram, let's look at, uh, let's look at teams that have supported technology, okay? Let's find folks who are generally using new tech inside their uh, you know, own teams, own workflows. Maybe that means they're actually showing up to your lunch and learn sessions. If you're doing like a DevSecOps a presentation, they actually show up, that's a nice indication initially. And then, of course, if they're working on something critical, I mean, those folks are a great place. If you can get a champion there, I mean, that's super high value. Otherwise, um, look for participation in your um, in your lunch and learn style sessions or in your training sessions. Moose, what are your thoughts? I think you hit it spot on the head. I think when, depending on the size of your organization, you know, smaller organizations, ever, software engineers tend to be more multifaceted than in your typical Fortune 100 type companies. So in, in the larger aircraft carrier style organizations, you really want to, you hit it spot on the head. Um, and that could be, you know, working closer with a centralized team, getting to learn that skill set. Maybe it opens up a door for that person to come to your team later on. Maybe not necessarily. Maybe they, they end up can using these skills to grow in their career. So there's many different ways to, to think about that. And I think all the ideas that you just shared are, are spot on. All right, and then one other question coming in, I think, I believe from LinkedIn, who ultimately is responsible for security and IT services? Is it more of a cybersecurity person or operations or other? So I'm actually, that's a really great question I'm gonna walk through here. So if you could, uh, so I'm gonna go try and get through this in about 10 minutes and uh, that way we can have some uh, interactivity and um, do a demo. So go, let's go to the next slide. So really, when you think about the reason why security exists, it's given the enormous cost of a breach and the scarcity of security researchers who can actually harden the applications against breaches. The obvious solution is, as we all know, shift security left, addressing the security concerns early and relatively easily in the development process. But as we have seen, even if developers act to fix vulnerabilities when they are found, they continue to introduce uh, vulnerabilities into their code base. So what's the truth? Like, well, I want to just, let's talk about how we can actually truly shift this left. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide, thank you. And so really, it's it's all about, we've been trying to do this for the last decade. Um, you you can see this is the typical slide where we can, the cost of a defect. Um, I believe it was an Elizabeth Hendricks talk years ago around, um, th this one really stuck with me when I first got into the DevOps realm was really so that we know the cost of the defect. But there's this other interesting aspect where you're incentivizing QA to find bugs. So they're always going to find more bugs there's a never ending supply of bugs potentially for them to find. So really how can you make it so that you're actually intelligently fixing the code so that it's not just hammering away at it. So let's, let's go ahead and dive a little deeper here. So really here's evidence um, to support that piece that developers are still introducing vulnerabilities at the same rate. This is evidence that if, you know, existing processes were, were, were in place and working, you know, if, if the existing open source vulnerability communities, um, reporting mechanisms and, and triaging and updates were, were working, we wouldn't have this correlation over the last uh, six, seven, six years now. Um, so let's go ahead and take a peek uh, going through um, some deeper analysis. So these are dependency alerts that we've um, sent out to active projects. So we're actually relying on more code with more vulnerabilities in it. And so if you click next for me, we can see that there's a 39% um, increase versus uh, in 2020 versus in 2019. Uh, and then also on the other side of the house, so, so we're talking about, we're gonna be talking about different things along the lines of code scanning with um, your SAS piece, uh, dependency um, 
and open source hygiene, as well as um, committing secrets into your code. You know, the advent of GitHub and open source um, and collaboration and the community driven approach really has made things easier. Um, but if you click here, we can actually see um, an in increase of about 60% over time for these um, credentials that are being leaked uh, in a public repository. So this is really um, an area that we have to, to have to think about a new innovative uh, way to um, approach this. And so let's go ahead and look at some of the common causes of breaches. Let's go ahead and click through this. So we can see web attack breaches. These are things that we know about. Um, it's going to continue. It's the web app. The, the web is the, the number one um, way that you're going to uh, potentially have a, a breach within your environment. And so a lot of folks are concerned about mobile apps. I have to make sure my mobile apps are secure. You really do. I mean, it's, I'm not trying to say that you don't have to be concerned about that. But when you think about the importance of that mobile app, it is in your consumer's hands. So there's a lot of brand recognition of having uh, an app that, that's ne doing nefarious things. But when it comes to the breach vector, um, you really need to be thinking about the, the web services that those mobile apps are, are calling to, because those are really truly your company's first line of um, outer, outer um, contact with the world. And if that's where folks are able to get through, that's uh, door one right in the house. So even over the years, um, this is going back with the Verizon data breach investigation reports, which some of the best research that's done um, in this realm. And as we can see here, web attacks is the number one vector um, going back over the last few years. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, talk to some of the challenges of improving these. So after 10 years of shifting left and DevOps and DevSecOps and SecDevOps, um, why do we still have these challenges? And it's the security teams are outnumbered. Given the enormous cost of a breach and the scarcity of security researchers who can harden applications against breaches, the obvious solution is to shift security left, addressing security concerns early and relatively easily in the development process. But as we have seen, even if developers have to fix vulnerabilities when they are found, they're continuing to get introduced and it's they're just outnumbered at this point. Um, and if we step through, this is, so they're professional developers outnumbered the security developers but also the amount of open source going into your applications is really going to be um, the part because you have direct control over about 30% of the code going in. That's other 70% is being brought in from the community through open source um, projects, package management systems. It could be in your code at this day and age, Linux is still an open source project. So if you're using um, infrastructure as code, things along those lines. Um, you really want to make sure you, you're um, addressing the entire stack. So for, uh, Let's go ahead and look at how folks are actually implementing this as well. So we have folks that are scanning more than once per week um, down there on the, that's that's not good. <laughs> so SAS scans per year, you have um, the majority of folks are doing less than one um, scan per week. So this is really, it's happening at the end of the build process. It's not an end to end let's integrate, let's bring the developers into the fold. This is a, we have to scan this app for X, Y, Z reason. We're gonna do this at the at the end of the process and hopefully we don't find anything. And most of the time when those things are found, they probably end up getting a business exception and going into production. Um, let's go ahead and next slide for me. So this is, an, this is drawn an analogy to a problem that actually existed years and years and years ago. Um, and so what you're looking at here is one of the first, um, First surgeries that happened. And what you see here is on the left is you have one of the uh, first innovations that actually took off relatively quickly, um, much in the same way that we've had a, a very big takeoff in automation, CICD, this one big buzzword that we all know about. And then you can look on the person on the right um, and, and he's spraying something. And this kind of didn't take off as much. I'm going to pause here and see if we can get uh, any Folks attended the in focus uh, presentation a couple months back. They probably know the answer to these. So let's ask the crowd who might uh, know what what the um, invention innovation on the left is, and who knows what the one on the right is. Switch over to chat here. Kevin, are you watching the LinkedIn chat by chance? I'm watching the LinkedIn chat. It'll be interesting because I was at in focus and presenting, and I do not remember what these inventions are called. I got to give a plug to uh, our senior director of product here at GitHub, Gray Baker, because this is one of the best talks I've seen. Um, and I definitely am borrowing this one from him because this it does such a great way to juxtapose how um, one thing has really taken off, um, but then the other thing has become the afterthought. 
Do we have any guesses or? So Frida said carbolic gas. It could well, be, that sounds like a technical I, 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 mean, I, I think that's right. So let's go to the next slide. So what we're talking about here is the inv innovation of anesthesia um, and antiseptics or list. Um, so really anesthesia was first discovered in 1846, used worldwide within a year, and it was everywhere within seven years. It was the standard. Um, antiseptics um, discovered in 1865, not as easily adopted. People were extremely skeptical about it. Um, took about 15 years, 20 years to get half-heartedly adopted. But now when you think about what we've all been through during the last uh, year plus, hand sanitizer, uh, making sure that we're, we're keeping our environments clean. This is the foundation of modern surgery and also maybe um, modern health um, and modern um, making sure that we're, we're keeping ourselves clean in a safe environment. And, and so really, actually go back for a second, Kevin. So really, when you think about this, um, over the last 10 to 15, even 20 years, um, security is more akin to that antiseptic side of the house. Um, whereas the on the left side, anesthesia was that DevOps innovation. Everybody read the Phoenix Project. Everybody installed Jenkins. Everybody began automating builds. But nobody really thought about how can we do this securely. Uh, I remember one of the, the easiest things, I mean, if you look at even a lot of the, the some of the popular open source projects from a security perspective, I wouldn't want to run half of them on an open network. Um, they, they, it's just security has always kind of traditionally been an afterthought um, in, in these things because it was, let's innovate. And it was always a business exception because, well, we're running these tools inside our wall, so we don't care that they're vulnerable. But really, that's at the core of this. So yeah, let's go to that next slide for me. And so really the core of what I'm delivering here is, is the fact that we really need to, to be thinking more. Go click through for me, one more. There's a couple animations on this one. So really DevOps has really, everyone's using it. It's taken over, it's, it's pervasive. We're at now security is trying to get a foothold in there. That's where if you, even if you look at DevSecOps or SecDevOps or OpsDevSec, like nobody can even agree upon the right vernacular when everyone agreed upon DevOps or Ops Dev, like that, there was a little phase in the beginning, I think where folks were unsure about that one, but DevOps quickly solidified. So this is, um, I love this from a perspective of, we really need to be thinking about this as a collective solution here and how we can bring security, going back to that initial discussion before I had um, some, right after my audio issues is really, you know, we're all humans here. Let's let's have a collective discussion around what's what's the best way to kind of approach this. Oh, you can, that's a, so that's a, we're good. Um, so at this point, we definitely want to um, get some feedback from the crowd and we, we are prepared to go through a demo. Um, if folks have some questions, Kevin, did you have um, a can demo prepared or do we want to have folks see if there was something they were interested in seeing first? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. If you're, if there is an aspect of GitHub Advanced Security that you're familiar with, and first of all, well, thank you, Moose. That was awesome. And I saw some folks kind of joking that, hey, what happened? We're talking about like DevSecOps and, and computers and IT and tech and whatever. And now we're talking about history, but um, it's an amazing uh, analogy. So thank you for that. Um, and shout out to Gray Baker who also uh, developed that talk. So that was a lot of fun and interesting. And so, uh, you know, as we kind of turn our attention away from the content that we were gonna kind of push your all way in the audience here, um, we would kind of prefer for you to maybe express your interest in which aspects of Give Advanced Security you'd like to see in a demonstration. Um, I have something canned, which is gonna basically demo the developer experience um, and how you can actually integrate CodeQL into your own pipelines. But uh, again, this is supposed to be your time. We just wanna make the best use of that time for you. So um, please feel free to share any thoughts, ideas. Um, Zach is asking for a link for the InFocus um session that, that that happened moose so let's make sure we get that to him i see gosh yeah, we'll dig that up thanks Zach. awesome awesome um i see tim strawbridge uh sharing an observation that most of the time it's one person cares about security and no one listens unless the company gets it that's a huge problem that we that we bump into um and it's a slow process you know and uh, that's why we you know we'll, shared some of those ways like practical DevSecOps, practical ways to roll out these programs. It's again, um, very much like a team to 
team approach where you're actually meeting with folks, building that relationship over time, not obstructing their ability to deliver on whatever their targets are in terms of the features, the apps that they're building. But um, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's definitely a challenge. So uh, that, that, is actually, that, that is a huge thing for me, even thinking back to like my own personal experience as well as working with customers is really, you hit it on the head is if you, if, if leadership is not concerned, if leadership is not bought in, that this is the direction the company needs to go in. One of my favorite adages from one of my favorite managers comes to mind here is if, if you can't change your organization, change your organization. So it's really come at that point, it comes down to personal career management. Is this a place that you feel you could thrive or is it time to kind of look, look for greener pastures for yourself? Roger that. Moose. That's uh, that's awesome. If you can't, what, what, how did you say that? If you can't, if, if you, you can't, can't change your organization, organization right? change your organization. That's great. Very fun. Very cool. Um, and I see. So, Billy, I saw you in the chat as well. Shout out to Billy Toban. Um, integrating CodeQL, something that interests you. We're definitely going to do that together. And that's going to be a little bit more low level technical. So we're going to walk through a pipeline implementation together, look at GitHub Actions and talk about maybe some of the uh, you know implications of that. So, yes, we will do that. Um, and I see Bill Will Willard um, asking about what license is needed. So yes, you do need access to GitHub Advanced Security, but the good news is that if you don't have access to that at the enterprise level for your organ, you do have um, code scanning. My understanding is that it's free on open source. So if you like fork a uh, node goat project or some uh, test project, then you can actually enable it there. And that's what we're gonna be demoing together is um, scanning node goat. So, um, if you'd like to go there, maybe what I'll do is actually share the link to that repo on github.com. And um, and that's where we can start our demo. So you all can follow along if you'd like, that might be interesting. So, okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And Mr. Moose, I would just maybe appreciate if you would call out as folks have questions and comments as we demo together, um, you know, call them out, uh, especially, um, yeah, especially the one that are relevant. Cool, what we're showcasing. Um, so let me go ahead and start with, yeah, why don't we start with this? Okay, bingo. Okay, so just to give you an idea of what I've done here to start is I went to github.com and uh, to the OWASP organization on GitHub and I cloned NodeGoat locally and then I pushed that back to um, I clone no goat locally and I push that back to this repository. Actually, this is learning journey test, so I should be going to, um, I also created a standard repo here, but it's the same content. So anyway, the point is that I've, I have this node repository that I pulled from the OWASP organization. If you wanna work along, if you kinda wanna do a little code along, feel free to do that. It's just github.com. I think it's backslash OWASP backslash node goat. Um, so feel free to clone that onto your, um, into your local. I'm actually, Kevin, oddly enough, I've been noticing, um, as I go and do these projects in the community, some like, um, more and more of the vulnerable web app projects are actually, they, when you fork them, they already have the code QL in them. Yeah. So it's so, be easier. Yeah. So that's easy. That's really nice. And then that kind of gives you visibility into like what it would actually take to implement a pipeline in prod. Um, fortunately for us, that has not been done here, but what has been done is pretty interesting. So again, Let's talk for a moment about what's what we're gonna what we're actually gonna demo together. And so we're, we just have those four elements. We want to pay attention to the integrated developer experience, right? What is GitHub Advanced Security at the foundation? Except an AppSec set of AppSec capabilities that empowers the developer. There's code scanning, there's secret scanning, um, and there are some aspects of SCA, but generally that's supplemental to your existing enterprise SCA tooling. So. That is what we're gonna be showcasing here. And so on the landing page, hopefully this is familiar to you, but maybe uh, more so to um, your developers who spend a lot of time in GitHub is the code tab, right? This is where you can see all your directories, where you can see your readme, how to stand up your project, a little bit of information about that. And I draw your attention for a moment to this security tab. And so what you'll notice if you do fork this into um, your, your personal space, or if you clone it and push it into your organization like I've done, if you have advanced security enabled, you're already gonna see some alerts being flagged. And so if you don't have advanced security enabled, you may not see code scanning and secret scanning, or if it's just on public, github.com and your user space with a public repo, um, you will not see secret scanning alerts. 
Um, and the reason for that is this. The reason is because we always scan in the public domain for any tokens that you leak, okay? And so there's nothing, you know, that's not a new practice, but in the private space, this is to, uh, you know, a private workflow for identifying and surfacing any secrets that folks leak. So if you're doing a code along with the node project, no goat project, you may notice once you push this into your uh, into a private repo, you have the Penabot alerts. That's that native SCA tooling that we said last week was a really low hanging fruit to enable day zero in your org. I encourage you to do that. The time to remediation via the Penabot versus not having the Penabot is significantly less. Okay, and so I think it's something like your forty within forty eight hour period, you're twice as likely to actually patch a vulnerability if you use the Penabot, and the Penabot will open a PR auto automatically. Okay, and so that's probably where my PRs came from. So yeah, check out the Penabot always opening all these PRs. Um, on my repo already. So anyway, just introducing some of these things at the top level. Um, depend about, go enable it on your org if you haven't already. I definitely would encourage you to do that. Really low hanging fruit. It's it's not, there's no cost, right? That's like included in your enterprise subscription. So it should be something that you all consider enabling. Um, then you have code scanning, which we're going to enable together. Here are some starter workflows. And these workflows are using GitHub Actions. You could just as easily use um, Azure DevOps or Jenkins, we just shipped a plugin for Jenkins, Concourse CI. I know some folks are big Concourse users out there. Whatever, Travis, whatever it happens to be, you can use that CI platform using our um, uh, CodeQL CLI. But we're going to do this with actions together, and then we'll talk about what it might look like using um, third-party CI. So uh, Haihua, I think, uh, asked for a link to the node goat. So I'm, let me just go ahead and do that before we move any further. I'll, I'll drop it in the chat for you, Kev. You will. Okay, thank you for doing that. That's awesome. That's great. That's really helpful. So um, yeah, so here are our starter workflows with GitHub Actions to integrate CodeQL into our repository. Again, this is repo level enablement. So just be, just be aware of that, right? There are some aspects of advanced security that you can enable at the organization level. We talked about that. That was based on Reza's feedback last week, but today we're just talking about repo level. Okay. Um, and then secret scanning alerts. Everybody's like, oh my gosh, this guy's crazy. He just leaked his AWS credentials on live, uh, you know, live stream. So these are, uh, you know, someone pushed these to no guilt. So my expectation is that, um, that we're not going to be uh, be exploited by uh, by these these credentials. But the point is that as soon as I push them, push this code to my repo, it had these credentials in there, and um, because secret scanning basically is a background process, there's no pipeline integration necessary. A background process that perpetually scans your repo uh, every time there's a commit and an introduction of new source for uh, credentials. Okay, and there's a there's a whole workflow here to drill down into these individual alerts. That's not what I'm going to showcase just yet because I don't want to distract you from um, the CodeQL piece, which I know was requested by Billy, um, Bill, and others. So let's talk about what it would look like to integrate CodeQL. Another nice thing is, if while the pipeline's running, if it takes a little bit of time for the results to actually be produced, um, we can dive back into secret scanning. We can look at org level enablement. So there's a lot of stuff that we can still do here. Um, while the you know while the code scan is actually happening, so it looks like Moose dropped in that link in the. So if you're in um, if you're in Goldcast and you're looking at the chat, that's where we dropped in the Node Goat project, and um, maybe we'll do the same in LinkedIn if we have it right. Okay, we have. I see it. Thumbs up. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and just enable Code QL. Don't blink because it's super fast. Um, and again, this is like the, a very simplistic use case. Okay. So I just want to say that. You know, if like if you're a, a, maybe like an AppSec leader and you've already started to onboard CodeQL and now your your teams are kind of you know working through that enablement, you're like, hey, I saw a guy enable this in three seconds. How come you haven't rolled it out yet? You know, based on your build complexity, um, based on your tech stack, there are levels of um, levels of effort that it would take to integrate this. But a JavaScript project, again, we have like an 80% true positive rate on JavaScript projects um, with CodeQL. So that's a great place to start, low hanging fruit. That's when we start to look back at like what repos does it make sense for us to focus on initially. So I'll stop talking at a high level and actually open up this pipeline. And so what you'll notice is that basically this workflow, if I click set up this workflow, we've scaffolded for you a GitHub Actions workflow that will run on, okay, so a GitHub Actions workflow named CodeQL. Yes. Kev, Kev uh, I'm gonna jump in here with a question from Arun. 
Um, is there a plan to implement branch level access controls or cloning specific files instead of full repo? Um, can you talk to that a little bit through um, the controls Git checkout might give you as part of this workflow? Yeah, so there's a lot to be said for that. I think as I was looking through the documentation this morning and I was um, just kind of prepping for this talk, one of the really nice ways to do that, if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, which is how do you how do you like ignore certain source directories and focus on others? Uh, yeah, so th this, um, for, for the, those following along at home, this, this when you think about a potential mono repository right. or JavaScript projects where you, you're keeping a lot of those the open source node modules those in modules. there, you're going to be doing some of this configuration for this. Yeah, so you can drop in a custom configuration either in um, your CodeQL analysis workflow itself where we are, or you can actually reference a custom configuration file that also lives alongside your pipeline in your repo. Um, so that's a little, yeah, so again, getting to like an, an up-level use case beyond just a simple enablement, if you want to exclude scanning things like your node modules or um, your test files, you can do that using a custom configuration file and referencing that from this workflow. Um, that's also how you include additional query packs with CodeQL. So rather than just the default queries, maybe you want, you know, to look for code quality scans, maybe you want write your own QL query, code QL queries, and you can reference those from that custom configuration file, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you to check out the docs. That's an awesome question, and Moose, thanks for calling that out. Um, yeah, I encourage you to check out the github.com docs. Um, we rest and uh, reference custom configuration with code scanning. That's probably the keyword search there. Okay, so bringing us back to the top here, I'm just gonna talk us through for a moment this workflow that's gonna perform a scan and produce um, results back in our security tab, okay? And so this is really one-time enablement, and then of course you can define the frequency at which the, your, your code is gonna be scanned here. And you know, we say that this is like, oh, look how easy it is, and of course we're gonna do this and all that stuff, but when you looked at the stats that Moose shared earlier, most teams, a vast majority of teams do not have SAS integrated in their pipelines. That's the reality, and the remediation is even worse. So even if they produce findings, they're not remediating them. Right, and so um, this is not to be taken with a grain of salt, even though the, the implementation itself can be uh, simplified. And so um, there's a few things here that I'll talk through. One of them is that, of course, we have an integration with the pull request. That's a great place to have conversation about the features you're integrating, but also the security of those features. Okay, so we can run a scan on a PR itself. Um, but what we also generally encourage folks to do is beyond the pull request, so every time a pull request runs, we perform a scan beyond just a pull request is a cron job. Because if there are zero days in, you know, that roll out or, or new queries that are roll out um, and your app is just sitting out there in, in legacy land in like maintenance mode, and you actually are not opening new PRs and not pushing code, you could still have a vulnerability that pops up a zero day or something that wasn't detected in the past that's now detected. And so um, you kind of have this like, while we're doing our development, we're performing this scan and then perpetually they're forward on schedule. And maybe for the folks, I know there was a conversation earlier that we had about like, well, who cares? You know, we gotta, how do we find folks who care? And one way to do that is like, okay, well, maybe it's less to ask if we're only running this scan like Sunday evening and they come in on Monday and you see like four results and you know, uh, of those four results, maybe you find something that's really compelling in there that then you could just work through on Monday, right? Like Monday morning as you're having your coffee. And so um, a cron is a great way as you're, you know, as you're starting at like ground zero, building the foundation for your DevSecOps program, a cron job is a really powerful tool. Um, it's very much less invasive, very much less high touch. So let's, get, uh, let's go ahead and go through um, this workflow here. We see some of the default permissions that we drop in, which are necessary for this workflow in order to contribute back to your um, security tab here for the GitHub token that's kind of ha that being used behind the scenes. Now, in this case, um, for this workflow, we explicitly define the language that we're scanning, but we also have auto detect. And so if you didn't have the language explicitly defined, you can have auto detect. You can also include, you know, if it's like, if it, if it is a mono repo and you wanna look for additional, um, if you wanna look, you know, run additional query packs. So instead of just a JavaScript query pack, you wanna also run Python or something, you can do that by specifying additional languages. And so what happens, maybe what I should say is, what happens when you specify a language is that's the, then the query pack that we use to scan your app. So we'll use JavaScript query pack initially. Um, 
kind of see AJ going back and forth in the chat with Mr. Moose. So that's awesome. Got some, we have some engagement there. And again, feel free to share any questions, comments. Um, I see Caroline talking about changing culture again, like, yes, absolutely. You know, we're, we're talking about tooling here. We're talking about integrated developer experience, but the foundation of all of this is that relationship. And so, you know, you can't say it enough, but then again, I don't want to, uh, yeah, I don't want to just say it so much that it kind of loses its, loses its, uh, its impact with you all. So again, let's talk through some of these steps. So your workflow is going to go get the repo. It's going to initialize code QL. Um, it's going to attempt to build your application. That's again why it's nice with the JavaScript repo because it's an interpreted language. It doesn't have to be built. If it's a Java app, a compiled language, it would have to be built and then scanned, and then we run the analysis. So this is very different from the steps that you would have if you had, um, you know, if you're using a CLI and third part um, and a third-party CI system, but it is using GitHub Actions. And a lot of folks I know, I think Fred's out there. I think we have Jason. Um, I think if we have Andy on the line as well. I know these are some folks that I've met with at different enterprises who are rolling out um, using actions and driving adoption. And so um, this hopefully is still relevant for, for many of you folks. Um, and if it's not, we also have, um, let me share this with you. There is a, actually, um, maybe I'll, I'll ask um, Moose to do that, is there is a blog post which describes how to run a code scan using uh, Azure DevOps. And so I'd encourage you to consider checking that out. And it's really simple. Um, using the CodeQL runner in the past, and um, and now kind of shifted that recommendation using the CLI. Moose, yeah, sorry. I was just going to double down on that. Yeah, so yeah. Um, any and for folks that might be using this in a public repository or um, rolling it out internally, definitely if you're using the CodeQL runner today, you're going to want to look at um, moving over to the CodeQL binary. It's got all the feature parity with what the runner had, um, ability to upload results and all that, as well as I'm just personal preference. I always love a good CLI if it's available. And that, that's, have you also ever heard, I've heard people pronounce it as Clyde before. Have you heard that one? No, that's definitely not Clyde. Yeah, that, that, yeah no, all right, it's CLI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, very funny, very cool. Okay, so while that's running anyway, let's go ahead and look in code, uh, secret skinning alerts and talk about this experience for a moment. So who's gonna see when secret scanning produces an alert? So it's gonna be your administrators and the people who contributed those tokens in the first place. And so I can drill down into this secret um, alert and I can see where that secret was contributed across the files that it was contributed. Um, I can see the commits themselves that actually leaked this token, who leaked the token. Um, here's the, the commit ID. And what's nice about um, you know, doing some of your development on GitHub and you'll notice this also with Dependabot is the vulnerabilities themselves are from open source projects. And the nice thing is that those open source projects live on GitHub. And so you have some really deep linking where you don't have to leave the context of the platform in order to understand you know, what the origin of the vulnerability was, who maintains it, and maybe like an advisory issue about that vulnerability. That's like, that's dipping my toes into Dependabot, which I think, and I hope next week we'll spend a little bit more time on, but um, I want to call it out anyway. So one thing I do want to share, just while we wait for code scanning alerts, um, okay, actually it already it already finished running. So the duration was a minute and 31 seconds, which was faster than I thought it would be. So let's talk about this. And if we have time, which we probably won't, um, we could talk about org level enablement. Otherwise we'll punt, we'll punt that to next week. Yeah, I see some folks saying, I thought CLI was pronounced silly. So uh, that's funny. So, uh, okay, yeah, let's look in the security tab here. What do we see? So we just ran our scan using code QL. That's what we need in the workflow, right? We ran it on the primary branch 35 seconds ago and 20 alerts surface. Now what you'll notice here is that there is the ability to filter um, based, uh, based on your tool. So did you run this game with code QL? Did you run this game with any third party SaaS tools and just surface those results inside the UI? That's also a possibility. Do you want to search by rule, AKA, are we vulnerable to any specific um, you know, type of vulnerability? We also have branch, severity, et cetera. And so maybe what I'll do is just dig into one of the individual alerts here. And so we can see that we have this code injection alert. We see the CWEs that it's associated with. We have these paths, let's go ahead and dig through um, the data flow analysis. And so you can see an analysis from source to sync as a developer. This happens just to be two-step, which is not super complicated and easy to detect. But the point is that a developer who comes in here, right, because that's who's going to be using this interface, 
The developer comes to the security tab. They'll get context about this vulnerability, okay? They'll understand some recommendations for remediation, get some examples how to patch it, but they'll also get, have a really clear understanding of maybe where that data should have been sanitized, where that call should have been sanitized before it made its way to the back end, right? Um, and so this is one of the ways that we're empowering developers is trying to take all this context and like make it into this nice integrated interface and make it simple and in front of the devs um, with that uh, with information. So again, um, you have your auditable history. You can see that I was the one who introduced the, the vulnerability um, and where the scan took place on, uh, on your branch. And then of course, you can take action on that. Maybe you dismiss this false positive views and tests won't fix. And what you notice is there's no fixed here. And that's because if you do patch that vulnerability, then, um, then it just doesn't show up in a subsequent scan. So you have one less finding, uh, one less alert. And so uh, actually what I'm gonna do, and Moose, I saw you come up mute, but maybe I'm gonna actually stop sharing my screen because um, we're practically up to time. The hour went so fast, but I'm glad that we're able to talk you through the integrated DevX. We're able to integrate CodeQL, show you what that pipeline looks like, and then talk you through the alerts experience. And so that was really awesome. And I think we got some great participation. So thank you for that. Moose, any uh, comments, closing words from your side? No, that was awesome. If folks have um, thoughts on what they'd like to see us um, go deeper on next week, um, you know, you did a great job walking through the CodeQL. There is a plethora of community scanners out there as well, as well as some new ones. Um, so if folks think maybe maybe going a little bit deeper on the code scanning piece could be advantageous as well. Um, that's certainly something we, we can uh, talk about as well. Um, there's also user defined patterns. Um, do we have, before we close, Kevin, do you have, do we have the, the QR code in the deck that we can share for folks? That, I know we, I was engaging with a few folks that might want to book a meeting and stuff. Um, or if we have that, do we have a link to share, Sean, for, for folks that might want to um, follow up with us? I, uh, you know, I'm not sure what's in, what's in LinkedIn, um, Andrew, but if you are, if you did join us via Goldcast, uh, there is actually a get demo button there. Um, but if, if we don't have a QR code up today, what I would say is, um, so I've put a couple of comments in LinkedIn. If you want to reach directly out to me, um, I can definitely push those meeting invites out to the appropriate people on the GitHub team. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. Thanks so, everyone for coming this week. Yeah, I think that about wraps it up, everyone. Um, you know, thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you for um, our final session next week, which is titled Overcoming Challenges with Developer First Application Security. So uh, with that being said, thanks again, everyone. Moose Kevin, as always, um, thanks for that uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, we will see you all next week. Sounds awesome. great. Thank thanks you. all. Take care. Have a great week. Stay cool out there. Thanks, Cheers. everyone.